Recently in Sydney, Australia, a young woman was arrested for a crime that she committed about four years ago. Or I should say a crime that she had started to commit four years ago. You see, uh, a young woman in Sydney, right before she turned 18, she opened up a bank account. And something kind of special happened to her bank account. You see, the bank gave her credit in the form of unlimited overdraft. Unlimited overdraft. What this young woman did with this feature that she soon discovered was she proceeded to overdraft credited $4.3 million. $4.3 million before people noticed. And now she's arrested. But here's the catch. A judge recently said that it's going to be really hard for anybody to prove what she did was actually illegal. Because she wasn't stealing money from the bank, she was simply using money that the bank gave to her accidentally. So really, in a sense, she didn't do anything wrong, kind of. But who here would agree that what she did was right? Not really. Even the courts say she has to give back the money or the assets that she purchased with the money back to the bank. But what she did, maybe, technically, wasn't illegal. And maybe that's what she told herself while she proceeded to spend all of this money. And it kind of brings to mind a phrase that perhaps you've heard before. That the ends justify the means. The ends justify the means. And what that means is that when you have a goal, a goal that you think is important, something that needs to happen, the means that you use to get to that goal, well, maybe it doesn't matter. As long as you get to the goal that you want to get there. Apparently this young woman's goal was to spend a million dollars on handbags because she did that. She didn't really care how she got that million dollars worth of handbags, but she made it happen. But we know that that's not the way we're supposed to live, right? That phrase, the end justify the means, rubs us the wrong way. Because as people who follow Christ, who love Christ, who know him, we know that we're supposed to operate differently, right? Here are some passages that maybe sound familiar about how we're supposed to live. Passages like from 2 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul said, Now this is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relations, relations with you with integrity and godly sincerity. We have done so relying not on worldly wisdom, but on God's grace. We know that when we have goals in life, the means we use to get there matter. Not being dishonest, not using things that maybe the world says is fine or legal or okay or even encouraged, we know that that's not the methods we use. We lean on God's grace. Here's another verse. Whoop. Apparently I forgot to put that verse in there. Well, take my word for it. <laughs> As the Apostle Paul drives home the fact that when we look at the world around us, What's something that a Christian can comfort themselves with? It's knowing that we don't use dishonest means. Instead, we pursue honesty. We pursue truth. We pursue fairness whenever we deal with the people around us. And so maybe, maybe it strikes us as surprising when Jesus appears to imply differently. When Jesus appears to encourage us to maybe be a little bit more like the world. And so let's turn to our first verse that we're going to look at today as Jesus says something that maybe is a little bit striking at first from Matthew 10, verse 16. He said, I am setting you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Now, as you read through that, probably the last phrase makes a lot of sense for Jesus to be saying, right? For us to be as innocent as doves. Doves that were kind of a symbol of peace, 
of innocence because they never attacked anybody. They were just doves. They went about their business. So be as innocent as doves. Of course, Christians are to do that. And this encouragement Jesus gave to his disciples before a really special occasion. It was before he sent them out away from his side to go throughout Judea and to proclaim the kingdom of God. And he warned them about any number of things. He warned them about that they were going to be persecuted, they could be locked up, they were going to be hated, they were going to be rejected. And so he says that beginning phrase, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. People are going to attack you and it's going to be rough. That's just the way it's going to be. And so as Christians, we're maybe used to hearing ourselves described as sheep as we think of Jesus as our good shepherd, thinking of as the lost sheep that he goes out and finds. So maybe even being described as sheep makes a lot of sense too. But that one phrase in there, that one phrase probably strikes as a little bit different. Be as shrewd as snakes. Not a lot of positive feelings come from that phrase, right? Let's take the word shrewd. We don't usually think of that as a positive word. You think of that young lady in Sydney, she was maybe being kind of shrewd. Hey, here's an opportunity that's not technically illegal. I'm going to make use of it to accomplish what I want to accomplish, which was a lot of handbags. But she accomplished it, right? She had an opportunity and she used it. That's maybe usually how we think of shrewd. Shrewd, maybe to us, feels like somebody taking advantage of someone for dishonest gain. And that phrase, being shrewd as snakes, doesn't really help with it, does it? What do you think of when you hear of snakes in the Bible? The devil, <laughs> right? Isn't that the famous snake in the Bible? that tempted Adam and Eve. He was even described as the most crafty of all the animals. Snakes generally aren't considered to be positive animals that Christians emulate. And yet Jesus is saying, be as shrewd as one. You see, even in that culture of that day in, in Middle Eastern desert thousands of years ago, snakes were considered to be very cunning, very wise. They struck when they knew they would win and they slithered away and left when they knew there was danger. They could read a situation and they knew how to play it for their own benefit. It was smart. It was cunning. It was crafty. They're shrewd. So Jesus says, be as shrewd as snakes. And yet, what? As innocent as doves. To be a pure follower of Christ, to be someone who's honest. Well, okay, how do we be both of those things? How does a Christian be both as shrewd as a snake and as honest as a dove? Well, maybe the hang-up and maybe the seeming disconnect that's there is because what do we usually associate shrewdness with? When do we usually associate somebody being crafty or cunning? It's when they're using their intellect and situations to benefit whom? To benefit themselves, right? Someone as innocent as a dove of God has a different set of goals in mind when they use their craftiness and their shrewdness. And Jesus describes maybe what this shrewdness can look like in a parable. And that's in our second reading that we're going to look at from Luke chapter 16. As Jesus lays out a parable about a very shrewd manager. And he ends it with something that honestly has confused a lot of people. Because Jesus says something else about shrewdness, something else about the behavior of a Christian that at first glance seems nothing as innocent as a dove. And so let's dive into that parable and dig through about how we're going to balance these two things that Jesus says is that we're to be. So from Luke 16, Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. The manager said to himself, 
What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. And he told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And this is the word of God. Do you expect that ending? Well, maybe not, right? Was that master anything, or was that manager anything like an innocent dove? Quite the opposite, right? He was very shrewd. He knew he was losing his job. There was no way to get his job back. And so what he did, keep in mind this is a parable, so this is a fictitious story meant to teach something. So this manager, what did he do? He approached the people who owed his master something, figured out the debt, and cut it in half. For what purpose? To gain friends. To gain people who would look out for him, who would help him after he was very soon going to lose his job. Now, how did the master respond? Did he respond like the master or the Lord that we heard about in Amos today in our first lesson who, who comes down with a harsh judgment? No, the master said, hey, you acted very shrewdly. Nice work. And then Jesus appears to say after that, hey, all you Christians, be a lot like that shrewd manager who was very dishonest and untruthful and was looking out for himself. Well, at least it appears that way, right? This is maybe why sometimes this section is com confusing, but that's why we should take a little time to think about it. The manager in this case, or the, the master in this case, is not synonymous with God, okay? That's why this is a parable. This is a story that's meant to teach a point. And what does the master praise the manager for? For simply being cunning, for being shrewd, for using a situation and working hard to gain something from it. And Jesus makes this observation as he's talking to a number of believers. He says, the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. The point that Jesus is making is that when you look at even unbelievers, people of this world, people who don't know of Christ, who don't value it, who don't value God's commands, who don't learn them and follow them, they deal very shrewdly, very cunningly, very wisely with one another. And why? So they can accomplish the goals they want to accomplish. But when he looks at the sons of light, believers, people who love God, who love his commands, who follow them, who live them, a lot of the times he sees not the same level of care, not the same level of wisdom to accomplish their goals. And so then he says this thing, that's maybe a little bit confusing. He says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And almost sounds like Jesus is saying, use the things of this world to gain friends and by doing that, you'll go to heaven. Kind of confusing. That's why I don't actually really like this translation. I don't normally do this a lot, but I like this one a lot more from the English Standard Version. This is the way it's said. He said, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Okay, maybe it's not a lot clearer yet, but bear with me. So what Jesus is telling believers is that we all have wealth. We all have things. 
We all have money, we have talents, we have time, we have things that belong to this world. And as Jesus over and over again states in his ministry, the things of this world oftentimes are used for sinful purposes, like the sons of the world. Acting shrewdly with all that they have, they use all that they have to accomplish their own selfish goals, but they do it in a cunning, a crafting, and a thoughtful, and a hard-working way. They are dedicated to using what they have to accomplish their goals. And yet, where do their goals lead them? Eventually, all that they've gained, all that they've been so shrewdly obtaining, fails. It goes away. The treasures of this world don't last. Either eventually you lose them in some financial disaster. You don't get to use them because your health fails before you realize it's going to happen. Or you die. You don't take all that you've gained, you work so hard for it with you. What Jesus points out is that the sons of light, the sons of light get to use everything that they have in this world, everything that belongs to them, all the opportunities that they're given, to accomplish a very different goal. That when everything that you have in this world is gone, when it's not in your pockets, it's not in your bank account, when that's gone, you get to look forward to something else. You get to look forward to seeing that the people that you've met in life, that you've shared real treasures with, they might receive you in eternal dwellings. That instead of using all the opportunities, the money, the means that you have for your own ends, you get to use all of them for accomplishing the ends that God has set before you, the ends of sharing treasures with other people that they may share in these treasures too. And so my question for all of us today is what are our goals? What do we want to accomplish? Just a couple of verses after this, Jesus points out what a lot of time our goals our shrewdness, our cunningness, our intellect, our time, and our talents are all used to serve. He says this, just three verses later, he says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now next week, we're going to spend some time exploring a little bit more about all the different things that distract us from God in this world, but I think Jesus' point here is clear. A lot of times, what shapes our goals? Our goals are shaped by the treasures of this world. Gaining more, and to the extent that we think about it, spend our time pursuing it, taking advantage of situations to gain more, almost eventually becomes our master, becomes our God. Even for you, you don't have that problem with money in your life. You're just not naturally disposed that way, but I bet there are any number of things you could replace with the word money. Relationships, prestige, accomplishments. There are all sorts of things that often become our master. And our goals reflect who our master is. We want our goals to serve our master. And our goals shape the means that we live in our life. Because depending on what your goal is, will shape what you do in order to accomplish it. Jesus says, the master that takes control of us when it's of this world, guess what? That master is going to fail you. And look at the world around you and even look within your own heart. We spend so much time serving these masters in our lives, shrewdly trying to accomplish these goals, and he reminds us, do we in the same way spend our time, our thoughts, and our actions to accomplish the goals of our real master? our master who gives us treasures to last. And that's a difficult thing when you look at the world and you see people fighting so hard for the treasures of this world and that shapes what you think is important. That shapes what I think is important. That shapes the, what our children think are important. And it shapes our behavior too. And yet in the back of our minds, we know that that simply doesn't satisfy 
There was a woman recently who found out the hard way the truth of this. She found out the hard way the truth of this. Her name is Elizabeth Holmes. A year ago, she was one of the highly praised CEOs and entrepreneurs, um, entrepreneurs in the world, whether male or female. And she was worth about $4.5 billion because of her medical startup. Maybe you've heard of it. Uh, it was called Theranos. It was supposed to revolutionize uh, the, diagnostic, the medical diagnostic industry. And it ballooned. It had, was worth $9 billion, and she had a 50% stake in it. $4.5 billion to her name. And you better believe that she probably acted shrewdly to get to that point. She probably took advantage of situations. She used every talent in her book in order to accomplish the goal of getting that company as successful as it was. Four and a half billion dollars. That's what Forbes a year ago estimated her worth as. Forbes just reevaluated her worth in light of recent reports and analyses that came out about the type of test that they were doing as it was discovered that the tests that they said were so revolutionary weren't really accomplishing what they were said to accomplish. Do you know what her net worth is right now? Zero. Essentially zero. Because her company basically worthless. Quickly, the treasures that she had worked so shrewdly to gain failed her and now left with nothing. What treasures are you desiring in your life? What are your goals? As you think about the goals in your life, it starts with first understanding what God's goal was. What God's goal was with you. I think these verses from Hebrews are going to shape what we think about that in a very important way. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. When you think about the goals you have in your life, think first about the goal that was in Christ's life. What was the joy that was his goal? The joy was you. The joy was me. That was his goal, was the joy of having us dwell with him with perfect treasures forever. That's the whole reason Christ used the means that he used to accomplish his goal. That's why he put up with a sinful world. God himself walking among dirt and sin and hurt and pain, living in this world for you. So that you could have the joy of real treasure, of heaven itself. This is why J Jesus even took up the cross and used that means of suffering and pain and torture for the goal of you. So that you could be forgiven for the times that your goals are anything but God's. So that you could know the treasures that are already worn for you, the treasures that already belong to you, treasures that you don't have to scheme and be shrewd and cunning in order to gain because they're already paid for, they're already bought for, and they are yours. Because you are God's goal. And he has already won it. He's already done it. And so that means you, your most important goals, your treasure that you know you want, eternal treasures, you already have them. Christ has already paid for them. He already went through the means to accomplish that end. And so now we are free to have different goals, different joys in this world. We get to have joys like what the Apostle Paul talked about in Philippians when he said this, when he was writing to these Christians that he had shared the gospel with, suffered for, went through so many things just to be with them and love them. This is what he said. He said, I thank my God, my God, every time I remember you. 
And all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in, in the gospel from the first day until now. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share God's grace with me. He wrote this while he was sitting in prison, void of any worldly treasures. And yet he knew the treasure he had in his heart. Treasure that would last so much longer than the chains that he was tied to. So much longer than even the pain the Romans could put him through. He had the treasure of the gospel, which told him and lived in his heart of the joy that Jesus has given him. And it was the same treasure that he got to share with other people. And that joy of just sharing it with others and sharing it with one another, even in the hardest times, that was treasure to Paul. Friends, this is, this is a joy we can have too. These are the goals that can shape how we live. To live in the joy that Christ has already won us and to share that joy with others. Listen to how else Paul talked, and this was our second line. He said, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I may, might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Friends, if our goals are to live in the joy Christ won for us and to share that joy with other, others, what are the means we are going to use? What are we going to shrewdly apply here at peace? and in our individual lives, in order to share in the blessings of the joy of the gospel. What are we going to do? You better believe that the sons of this world, in their shrewdness and their cunningness, they work hard. They sacrifice. They put up with a lot to accomplish their goals. What are the sons and daughters of the light going to do here at Peace? What are we going to do in our own lives and what are we going to do as a church? What are we going to plan? What are we going to sacrifice? What are we going to work hard? As we seek to accomplish these ends of sharing heavenly treasures with people that know they need them so badly. I don't have all those answers yet. None of us here at Peace do. But let's encourage each other to be shrewd. <laughs> and innocent. Innocently seeking the ends and the goals that Christ has laid out for us. As he has sent us out, maybe in a world full of wolves, and yet sheep that are armed and equipped with so much. Let's think about our talents and our opportunities and the skills that all of us have and all of us have together in order to accomplish Treasures that won't fail us. Treasures that are worth sharing. Treasures that have already been bought and paid for. What are our goals going to be? Amen. Please pray with me now. Dear Heavenly Father, it's so easy to be distracted by the goals and the treasures of this world, and so we thank you to direct our, that you have directed our eyes on you. That you first directed your eyes on us when you sought out the cross, when you used that means to forgive us, to forgive us for the times when we're distracted by so much and to give us treasures that do last, the treasures of forgiveness, salvation, and heaven, treasures that far surpass anything in this world. Give us the shrewdness, the cunningness, and the dedication to use the other kinds of treasures you have given us in this world to share those heavenly treasures with others. Help us to use opportunities, to use our gifts, for those ends, for those goals. In your name we pray, amen.